Thank you, Carly. Um, all right, so welcome on this wonderful Friday. Um, so essentially, we're going to be going over some tips for film photography. And I've, I've sort of structured this presentation so that it can apply outside of film photography. Maybe you've got a digital camera that you like to take on your vacations or photos that you want to take with your family. That's sort of the stuff. So this will sort of not only apply to phone photography, but to, I would say, photography as a whole. Just a quick background on this photo. Uh, it is actually taken with my phone. I was in Iceland uh, last year and uh, the car that we rented is parked off to the side. My girlfriend actually has my actual camera taking photos of Icelandic horses. And I saw this beautiful, I guess, mountain, hill, whatever it may be. And I decided to step in the middle of the road and just take the photo of what I saw. So, you know, you don't need um, expensive gear to get great photos. Um, it's a matter of what you choose to include in your composition and we'll kind of go through all that kind of stuff um, in today's presentation. Okay, so just a, a bit of a, an agenda, what I'll go through. So I'll talk about photography and science and healthcare, uh, you know, some of the equipment you might need or want to use. Uh, we'll go into some basics about photography. We'll talk about exposure and then uh, I've got some rules of composition. Uh, then what I'll do is actually I'll go into an editor uh, and I'll show you how you guys can edit some of your photos. And then at the end, I have a bit of a photo assignment uh, should you choose to participate. And I think it'll be really fun for everybody. Okay, so photography and science and healthcare. So, um, you know, some might say that, uh, you know, science may not be as visually interesting as some other fields like, you know, fashion or marketing or whatever it may be. But I still think photography is very applicable. Uh, the goal of photography or with any visual medium is to tell a story. Uh, so you want to convey a message. You want to, you know, elicit emotion and feeling in your photos. The photo on the top left, uh, you can see right here, is actually from an ER doc at Toronto Western, Dr. Don Lim. And she's actually um, a photographer um, outside of her role as an ER doc. And she put together this photo essay showcasing um, you know, the ER during the COVID-19 pandemic and how Toronto Western was um, dealing with it, their preparedness and how they responded to ER cases. And it was wonderful. We actually put these photos into a sort of a music video using a local Toronto artist and um, it, it was very well received, but it told a story. It told the story of how uh, the healthcare team and the frontline staff came together and is dealing with this pandemic. The second reason photography um, applies to science and, and healthcare is you wanna show your work. A lot of researchers are working relentlessly uh, on their projects, trying to find cures, trying to find better methods, trying to improve uh, in the field that they are researching. So photography is a great way to showcase your work. The next thing we wanna do is educate. Um, you know, science is no good if it's stuck in the lab. And um, that really resonates with me because we, we want to, to show and educate the public about what's going on. And we want to show that, you know, what we thought before maybe might not be right. And this is how we're changing it. Or we found this new thing that may make, you know, uh, life better for everybody or whatever it may be. And the last thing I think is really cool. And this kind of is a personal thing for me is that science has really cool toys. You know, we get to play with some pretty cool equipment. Um, some of the researchers do at least, and we can show that off. You know, people don't necessarily get to see that and we can explain what, some of these things do through photos um, and maybe through some captions and accompanying text, right? If you think about it, maybe you've got this really piece, uh, really expensive piece of equipment in your lab. Um, say it's made by Illumina and it's a sequencer and you take a photo of it, you post it online and you tag Illumina or that company it's made from and they contact you and they're like, that's really cool. You know, what are you researching? And then you get talking about your research and next thing you know, you might want to be, you might be featured on their website about, you know, how their products being used in your research. So, I believe photography really does play a big role in visually communicating science and there are many ways to do it. Um, so next I'll sort of go off over some of the equipment that you need. Uh, the first thing is light, of course, <laughs> without, without light, there is no photography. And I think it's not more so, you know, having light, but understanding how light works. Um, it, it can be a bit challenging, but as you start to take more photos and you, and you start to, to see the world, um, with sort of a photography hat, you'll understand how light falls on your subject and how light can be shaped and all those good things. Um, the next thing you need is a, a phone with a camera. Uh, most smartphones and most phones these days, if you have one, um, have a camera. And there's a built-in stock 
camera application that you can use that will take photos and they auto expose and things like that. Uh, the next thing you will need is a photo application. Uh, so I use Lightroom and Lightroom Mobile personally, and it is a free, it's free on your phone. Uh, there is a paid version that you'll unlock some other editing features and things like that. Um, but Lightroom for the most part is free and is the free editor. And some of these apps also can turn your camera into a manual camera where you can control certain settings. And I'll go over those settings a bit later. The last thing you need is your creativity. You know, um, for photography is how you choose to visually express your world. Um, how, what you choose to include in the frame, what you choose to exclude, what perspective you take it from, that is up to you. You get to make those creative choices. So, you know, there's a lot of room for experimentation. There's a lot of room for uh, your own personal um, flair to any of the photos that you take. Okay, so I'm gonna touch a bit on the exposure triangle. Basically, uh, we're gonna talk about three settings and we're gonna talk about how they're gonna influence your photo and how you can control them to get a desired effect uh, when you're taking photos. So the first thing is ISO. Um, this is something that uh, is, is, it's basically um, a property of a film uh, and that's, it got translated to digital sensors and digital imaging uh, when it came out in the early 2000s. So essentially it is, it's a number that um, basically, how do I explain it without getting too technical, but it basically tells you the sensitivity um, of light, the sensitivity of your sensor to light. So the lower the number, the less sensitive your sensor is to light and um, the more light you're gonna need to expose your sensor or the film, you know, as it were be back in the day. In low light, you'll see a lot of photographers or you may want to increase your ISO number. So you get to a higher number, meaning that your sensor is now more sensitive to light, meaning that you don't need as much light to expose your photo. Um, you gotta have to find a balance with this setting because the higher your ISO, the more artifacts and, and grain and things and unwanted things you're gonna have in your image um, that may take away from the photo that you're trying to capture. The second thing is, is aperture. Um, this may not apply to smartphones, but uh, because most of them have a fixed aperture and basically the aperture is kind of think of it as your, as your pupil. Um, so you can change the aperture to either let more light in or constrict it or make it smaller to let less light in. Um, if you have a, a camera uh, with a fixed lens, you can sort of, if you look at the lens and you change the aperture to anything other than the lowest, uh, smallest number, and you hit the shutter, you'll see that um, the blades kind of constrict and, and form a bit of a pupil uh, before it takes that photo. Um, again, the aperture also affects the amount of light hitting your sensor. The third thing is your shutter speed. So uh, with cell phone cameras, uh, the shutter is electronic, meaning there's no sort of, um, I guess, kind of like a window that comes down and opens up. Uh, and basically, you can have slow or fast shutter speeds. And you kind of have to find a balance of, of what you're trying to capture based on, you know, your, your photo and your frame. So slow shutter speed allows a ton of light to get in. So if you're, you know, you might be in a really dark situation, you might want a slow shutter speed. But the caveat to that is that you might get a lot of motion blur or you might get a lot of camera shake because you have to keep your phone very steady. On the other hand, you could have a fast shutter speed, which is great for capturing motion and uh, freezing action and things like that. So you, in, in this sense, you kind of have to, you know, know your shutter speed in, in terms of, it's a spectrum and trying to you have to find that sort of middle point or whatever shutter speed that works best for your photo. In this photo here, um, I actually took this with my cell phone at Bathurst Station. Uh, you know, going home from work. And basically it's a bit of a slower shutter speed because you kind of see the train moving here. And, and that was intentional. You know, I wanted to create that sense of motion with that. And um, you can get this by taking, you know, with your cell phone. And, uh, and the way I just kind of held myself still was I held my breath and hoped for the best uh, when I took that photo. So, um, you know, like I said, you can get that with your phone. And if you have a camera application that allows you to change shutter speed, you can sort of get creative by changing um, any one of these settings within uh, your camera application. Aperture, again, not so much, but ISO and shutter speed, you can definitely play with if you're exploring you know, manual settings and things like that. Overall, the goal is to control light. That is the goal, because if you can't control light, um, you essentially won't get a good photo or a photo in, that 
would you know mean anything to you or convey your story or message. So at the end of the day, with photography, your goal is really how you control light using your ISO aperture and shutter speed, what we like to call the exposure triangle. So you kind of understand now how to expose a photo, but then what's next? The next thing is composition. You know, these are sort of a set of guides and rules and they can be broken, but I feel that we need to understand these rules and guidelines first before we can break them. And you know the reason why you're breaking them when you do break them. So this isn't gonna be an exhaustive list of all the rules of composition and things like that. Um, I will have a ton of resources at the end for um, links to where you can read about this and listen to some videos and podcast type things that'll kind of go over some of these rules and explain things a bit more in depth than uh, what I'll sort of touch on here. So we'll talk about filling the frame. So if you are taking portraits, this is kind of what you want to do all the time or 90% of the time. It really depends on, on your portrait. But if you're taking a headshot, the goal is to isolate the subject. If you're taking a portrait, say for someone who might've just won an award um, or someone who is gonna be featured in a news story and you wanna showcase that scientist um, and you wanna do that by showing a portrait, you can you know, sort of take a headshot, fill the frame, kind of get rid of anything that's distracting in, in the background, messy lab benches, whatever it may be. But the goal with this sort of rule of composition is to, to fill the frame and really have your subject be the main focus. Um, the second thing is the, the rule of thirds. If you want to sort of imagine um, a grid of nine, so you're going to you know, kind of make this square into nine equal sections. And where the lines intersect, you want to place a point of interest or something interesting in your frame. In this frame, you kind of see young Dundas Square is on that sort of top left grid and this Jack Ryan poster is on that top right. Um, and not, not uh, there doesn't have to be something at every point, but you know, you can kind of put your most visually interesting things in the photo on those points. Um, and, and that sort of can help you compose your, your photo. Uh, the second thing I like to mention is cutting off limbs. I see this a lot with uh, people photography and um, you know, in groups of photos and, and, and things like that. Um, we don't want to cut off people, people's limbs. It, it can be a bit distracting because the eyes like to see things as a whole. And if you cut off people's hands or their legs and things like that, it, it's sort of a bit distracting and it feels a bit um, incomplete. Um, so, you know, if you're taking a full length portrait, commit to that. If you're taking, you know, a half uh, shot just to uh, sort of uh, waist up, you know, make sure their hands aren't cut off or things like that. Um, and just be mindful of, of cutting off people's limbs because it's, it, like I said, it doesn't complete the photo. Uh, the, the fourth thing is something I like to do a lot. It's called subframing. It's basically using elements within your frame to isolate your subject even more. So uh, this is the wonderful Frank from Dr. Mark Reed's lab at the Center for Medicinal Chemistry and Drug Discovery, which is in Max Bell um, at UHN. Uh, so, uh, here, what I did was I saw the lab bench and I was like, oh, there's a bit of space here. And this top bench is kind of, you know, cut off the top and this bottom part there's I think test tube holders or um, uh, centrifuge tube holders or whatever it may be, kind of uh, cuts them off here. And you can kind of see he's kind of isolated, right? You know, he's kind of, his, his, uh, his head is kind of between these two um, things in the frame or the shelves, so to speak. And also, this fume hood on the left and whatever this thing on the right is, I, I think it's another fume hood, but he's kind of in his own little square. And that kind of draws your viewer in, right? You, you framed your viewer. Um, and as much as there may be some distracting elements, you sort of hid that by subframing your subject. And this is one of my favorite composition things. And I, and I will do this a lot in my photos if I can. Um, and it's, it's a great way to, to isolate your subject in what may seem like a busy environment. Uh, the second thing is, uh, sorry, the, the fifth thing here is leading lines. Uh, leading lines are great because it draws your viewer in. If you're in research, you know all the lab spaces kind of look the same. There's benches upon benches upon benches and they sort of have you know, leading lines. You can place people in the center and have that great leading lines of the benches on either side. And 
those lines will draw you into your subject, whether it be of a person, of a cool microscope, or anything like that. So this photo here, you can kind of see Toronto City Hall at the center and the roads lead in to City Hall, um, as well as uh, the buildings kind of lead into City Hall and that's sort of the main point of focus here. Uh, the next thing I talk about is repetition. Repetition is basically repeating elements um, of similar characteristics within your photo. And this sort of creates a pattern and our eyes love patterns. So in this case, um, this is actually from the vegan bake shop that is on the corner of Leonard and I'm not sure what that street is, but it's just outside Toronto Western. Um, and I forget the name of this bake shop, but here you can see the pattern of circles that are created by these mini vegan donuts, which uh, were actually really delicious. So you can see these circles being repeated throughout this frame. And that's pleasing because your eyes recognize that's a pattern and um, it creates a visually interesting photo. And, you know, beside the fact they're also very delicious um, and they look appetizing, but again, the pattern creates these repeating elements that are visually pleasing. Uh, the next rule is sort of the, the rule of odds. And this is different from the rule of thirds because this has to do with the amount of things in the photo. Uh, and this sort of states that um, images are more pleasing in odd numbers. So you're looking at, you know, one, three, uh, five, seven, and things like that. So in this case, I've got, you know, two coffees and um, I don't know, whatever that is, a, a baked good. But um, it, it's a bit more pleasing because it, it, in this case, it creates a shape. It's a triangle, as you can see. And, you know, people recognize that, that shape and that pattern and um, their eyes can kind of move throughout the frame and, and recognize that. So even with people, you know, maybe you're photographing in a group of people and, and maybe, you know, it's three, five people that that's going to, you can set them up in such a way that um, it's going to create visual interest and depth. Um, so the rule of odds is uh, interesting. You play, you can play around with it with, with you know, people in a frame, uh, with objects on a table, um, and anything like that. Um, the next sort of rule is simplification. Um, simplification is sort of a play on negative space. Uh, it, it's things that you, you wanna exclude from your frame, things that don't add any value to your frame or to your photo. And it's a way of letting the subject in your photo breathe a little bit. So people can take a minute to pause and understand why is this place there? Or what is this um, subject, what, what is this subject trying to tell me? Or what is this photo trying to tell me with the way that things are placed? Uh, this photo on the right was actually, I was in Vancouver and there was this alley um, and uh, it was, I think pink and yellow was painted and it was actually really cool. Um, and so I actually decided to make this black and white just for the, the fun of it. And I thought the color was a bit distracting. Uh, and on the ground here, which you can't see, I've kind of cropped it out, uh, is a bunch of, you know, poles and pillars and garbage and things that really don't add anything to the frame. Um, and I actually did jump quite high to get this photo. My girlfriend kind of snapped it for me, but uh, it, it sort of takes, tells you to pause a little bit and be like, okay, what's going on here? Um, you can kind of see the geometric shapes I've included are only squares and rectangles that have our hard edges, as you can see here on the left-hand side, you know, these rectangles being created. But if there's anything in your frame that doesn't contribute to your, to your photo, maybe you want to consider excluding it and sort of simplifying the frame. Um, so in a sense, these, these eight rules um, are not exhaustive by any means. Um, I, I want you guys to consider some of these rules. You don't have to include all of them when you're taking photos, but these are some of the rules of composition that will help you create more visually interesting photos and sort of make you a better photographer. And, um, you know, these things, you know, you can, you can do, take these things with your phone. You can take these things with maybe a camera that you already own, but think about what you see in front of you and how you can apply any one of these rules of composition to, um, to the photo that you're taking. The next step in the process is, is editing. Um, now, editing can seem like a daunting task because maybe you've seen people do like speed edits with Photoshop and they're doing like 50 different things at once to create this sort of uh, pleasing image or this composite image where you take, you know, one part from one image and another part from another image to make some really cool new image. Um, and and in that, you don't have to necessarily do that to get a good photo. You know, there are a ton of editors and ton of editing applications. Um, like I said, I use Lightroom Mobile. Um, there's Snapseed, which is great on Android. Um, Instagram has a great editor as well that you can go through. 
Uh, and I'm actually going to take you through Lightroom. Uh, this is going to be the desktop version, but all this will apply to the mobile version. And you're going to find all these settings um, in other applications as well that you'll be able to manipulate. So the layout for these settings are, is essentially going to be the same. And the functions that you're going to be able to control is essentially going to be the same. It's just going to look different because it's going to be a different editing application. Um, but I'll sort of take you through what uh, Lightroom does here. Let me see if I can share my screen. And here we are. Okay, so uh, I think everyone can see this screen here. Um, it is a photo of a pizza that I made like three weeks ago. I'll kind of walk you through uh, the windows and some of the things here. So on the left, you have all your photo. Top left here, you have all your photo information. So you can, that's the file name it gave. My iPhone gave that file name when it was taken and the dimensions in pixels. If you multiply these two numbers, you will get the number of megapixels your camera has. If anyone wants to crunch numbers, I know you scientists love doing that. So we'll go through uh, some of these the things on the right hand side here. And I'm gonna explain things as basic as possible. And I want you to take some of these principles and maybe apply them to your own photos and edit them and you know, get creative and see how you can enhance your photo. Um, and, and make it, you know, slightly better and have people, you know, engage with it more. Um, and I'll tell you, yes. I'm just going to pause for a second. Um, the screen yeah. that I'm seeing is actually really small. Uh, I don't think that your whole window is viewable. I'm okay. only seeing about an inch across the uh, screen. It looks like it's sort of like... Okay, give me one sec. Is it that one? Is that the top part? I'm just seeing a white bar now with the uh, file name. Oh. oh my gosh. Let me share. What about now? Perfect. Okay. And you can see the Thank right hand you. side as well, the tabs on the right side. Yes. Okay. You perfect. You have to call out some of the wording because it is okay. slightly smaller. In terms of the text size, it kind of looks like it's a size eight for okay. me, but sure. that's great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So I will sort of take you through some of the basics of, of editing um, with this photo right here. And um, so I'll dive right into it. So on the top right, uh, this is sort of the histogram, kind of tells you where your color values lie, where your dark spots, uh, the dark, darkest parts of the image lies and the lightest parts of the image lie. You can sort of manipulate your photo in here, but I tend to avoid that. And I, I wouldn't recommend that for beginners just because um, things can get a bit crazy. Uh, the second sort of toolbar here, you have the crop tool on your left, do this sort of grid here. Um, and that's the only one I'm going to focus on. The other ones here have to do with sort of specific editing. This one's for red eye reduction. This is for like blemishes and things like that, that you want to sort of erase out of your photo. Uh, this one's a graduated filter where you can kind of create a gradient and only affect part of your image. This one's radial, which is basically you can create a circle and only affect part of your image with certain edits. But uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to avoid the sort of last uh, four or five tabs here. But the first one is cropping. This photo, you know, it looks good. It's, it's uh, you know, the, you have one point of interest here, which is the pizza. You kind of have your rule of odds. You kind of have only three things in the frame that really, you know, stand out to you. But I kind of, I don't like this sort of black space here, which is the edge of the countertop. So I'm going to click this button and crop in. And you'll be able to do this on your mobile phones with your fingers, just pinch and zoom in and, and things like that on your photo. But I'm going to make this a little bit uh, tighter, essentially, so that we can only get our pizza in frame here for the most part at the countertop. So I've just cropped my image. Great. It's looking a lot better. I filled the frame essentially with this. Uh, and the next sort of tab is the basic tab, which is basically where I'll focus most of my time on. And you'll, you're going to see, you're going to see all these settings um, with any sort of editor, whether it be uh, Snapseed, uh, Instagram, they all sort of have these types of settings built in. The first one is uh, we like to call the white balance tab. It's basically what it is, is sort of the temperature and sort of the overall kind of uh, cue and tones of your image. And temperature, for the most part, is measured in Kelvins. And uh, the 
lower the Kelvin, the more blue it is. The higher the Kelvin, the more yellow it is, or we like to call this as coolness and warmness. Uh, so I can sort of manipulate the slider, either get you know really blue, that looks super unnatural, it's not something we really want, or I can get really warm, that doesn't look natural either. So what you're gonna wanna do is try and find a balance where it does look natural, and then I'm gonna kind of leave it at where I shot it at, which was about 2800. Uh, tint is similar to, to temperature, but it sort of affects green and magenta values, as you can kind of see here. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, you know, we can all the way to the left, and if your pizza looks like that, you've got a problem. Um, you've also got a problem if your pizza looks like that too. So you gotta, again, have to find a balance. And I encourage you with your photos to kind of play around with this, see what works, see what doesn't work um, with all these settings. I know Lightroom and some editors may have an auto function, which is great. So in this case, I can say as shot or I can say auto. And there's some other ones here, depending on the lighting that the photo was taken in. So if you know that your photo was taken outside in bright daylight, you can hit daylight and you know it'll adjust for that. I'm gonna say auto and see what that comes up with. And that's great. It looks good. It looks natural, looks what any pizza would look like. Uh, the next part is basically controlling some of the tonal values in your image. When I say tonal values, I mean, you know, the brightest parts of the image, you know, the midtones of your image, uh, and the shadows of your image, some of the darker parts. Exposure basically affects the entire image as a whole. So you can either make your whole image brighter or your whole image darker with exposure. Uh, contrast, what it does, it tries to create the most space between, um, or, yeah, I'm going to say it that way. It's going to try to create the most space between the darkest points of your image and the brightest points of your image to create separation. So if we increase contrast, we can see the darker points getting darker and the brighter points getting a bit brighter. And you can kind of see on the, the histogram up here how it's sort of being pushed to either end um, if, you if you decrease contrast, everything kind of just falls in that mid-tone range and kind of looks a bit washed out. Again, play around with it, see what, work see what works for you and what works for your image and what your own personal editing style may be when it comes to images. For me, I like a little bit of contrast, so I'm, I'm gonna increase this just a little bit. The next setting here is highlights. Now the highlights are bright areas of your image. So the things like, like countertop, um, the sort of parchment paper, um, if we can sort of either kind of increase those values, make them brighter, or we can decrease them if they are too bright and kind of recover some of those values. You can kind of see how the countertop gets a little bit, you know, darker. You can kind of see a little more of the pattern in the countertop because we bring down the highlights. Um, I kind of like where it's at with this photo. I'm going to leave it where it is. The next setting are shadows. The shadows are you know, the darker parts of the image, the shadows, kind of the, the basil that I put on the pizza here is a bit darker. You know, the handle edge here is a bit darker. So the oven mitts kind of live in the shadows. So uh, parts of your image are going to live in your, in your shadows as well. And you can adjust that if you say some parts are too dark, you know, you can bring up your shadows a little bit or the shadows may be a bit too bright and you might want to bring that down a little bit. So once again, you can have fun with this and slide it left and right, see what works with your image. Um, whites. Basically, this, it's a bit tricky because whites and highlights kind of affect the same tonal values, which is basically the bright parts of your image. And essentially, when you increase the whites here, you're kind of setting what your brightest part of the image is. All right, so you could move it all the way to the right and be like, okay, that's the brightest part of my image. And you could go into your highlights and sort of play around within that range of how bright you want it to be or how you know, dull you want it to be or not as bright you want it to be. And the same thing kind of applies to the, the black point as well. So how, what your darkest part of your image is gonna be. So you can kind of set what the darkest part is gonna be by kind of dragging it to the left, or you could be like, nah, I want my, my dark parts to be a bit more in the mid-tones or a bit brighter, so you can kind of raise it up that way. Um, in a way, you can kind of create contrast using black and white because you can move these darker and you can move the, the whites brighter and you can kind of see that contrast created using this instead of the contrast slider. Uh, the next sort of tab I'll go over is texture clarity and dehaze. Texture kind of it, you know, affects the midtones of the image. So in this case, it, it'll probably just affect the crust only and, and things like that. And you can kind of bring in some detail in those midtones. Uh, clarity affects the entire image and it 
it sort of affects the midtones as well, but you'll sort of see it affect um, the whole image and it kind of desaturates it and takes some color away if you kind of go all the way to the right. It looks a little washed out, but it's very punchy and contrasty. Um, I tend to use this one sparingly because it can kind of get to look unnatural and you know not authentic to your photo. And you move it to the left and it looks soft. And some people will do this to smooth out skin and, and uh, use it for portraits because it's a, it's a quick, uh, quick way to kind of hide, you know, any, you know, um, imperfections or things like that. If you want things with uh, smooth textures and things like that in your photo. Um, Dehaze is mainly used by landscape photographers. And if there is sort of, you know, if you think about a photograph and there's a lot of fog in it or, you know, low hanging clouds, uh, people will crank up that dehaze to get rid of that. And it sort of brings a lot of contrast and gets rid of those sort of hazy elements in your photo. Um, you likely won't be using this when you take portraits or anything like that. So um, I really wouldn't worry about playing around with this slider too much. But again, it's up to you. See what you like, see what uh, works best for you with any of these ones. Uh, vibrance and saturation, they're very similar. Vibrance sort of affects the midtones that are, or sorry, kind of affects colors that are muted. So in this case, maybe the crust is a bit muted in terms of color. Some of the cheese looks a little muted in terms of that color. So you can increase the vibrance and it'll sort of bring out those colors there. Saturation affects the whole photo as a whole uh, in terms of its overall color saturation and color values. You can increase that all the way right. And um, you've got uh, a very saturated image like that. Um, may not be as appetizing, but uh, you know, like again, you can play around with saturation see what works for you. The next thing is the tone curve in Lightroom on the right hand side. And the tone curve is uh, basically this line here that you can manipulate and you can add contrast and you can play around with it and, you know, make things brighter and make things darker. Uh, I would recommend understanding the basics tab first because uh, this will be easier to sort of grasp and, and, and understand in terms of values. The tone curve, you can sort of kind of go crazy with it, but um, it's a bit harder to control and really dial in where you can sort of punch in, you know, numbers here and get really precise. And this is more so, you know, you have to look at your photo and understand where things are being affected and you can add points to this line and move it. You can also affect different colors. So you can only affect the reds in the image. You can only affect the greens in the image or the blues in the image. And it's a bit more complicated. I'll leave a ton of resources that go really in depth into the tone curve and how you can use that if it's something you're interested in. And the last thing I'll talk about is um, hue, saturation, and luminance. And not all editors will have this built in, but I figure I'll touch on it because some of them do. I believe Snapseed may have something like this. So hues are basically, you know, you've got um, this, this set of colors here and you can kind of push the color uh, that you see in your photo either to one side or to another and that kind of affects the hue. In this case, you can kind of see the glove and the, the ham being affected on this pizza kind of looks a little unnatural and here it looks a bit more orange. So um, wherever those sort of color values lie in your photo, you'll be able to, to manipulate. So I can manipulate the orange, oranges, yellow, green, aqua, blue, and, and change all of those to sort of bring out colors or change colors that may have been photographed a bit more unnaturally. You can want to make them look a little more accurate. And then you can, back the saturation of those colors. So basically, you know, how saturated those reds are in your image or how saturated the oranges are. If I crank that up, you kind of see the cutting board and the crust get a little more saturated and nothing else is kind of affected. The next tab is luminance. So how dark or bright those color values are. So I can make the reds really dark and you can kind of see the ham get really dark here, or I can make it really bright and, you know, you can see the glove get really bright and uh, stand out a bit more. This tab is actually the really most fun for me, I find. Uh, I find you can get some really cool color combinations and uh, really get um, some interesting looks to your image. And like I said, these sliders, don't be afraid of them. Play around with them. You'll realize that, ah, oh, that doesn't look too good and you know, take it back the other way. I find if you go extreme first and then sort of dial it back, you'll get a good sense of what looks good, what works and what doesn't. So that's sort of the basics of Lightroom. And like I said, you're gonna find this with any other editor. This will be on Lightroom Mobile. This will likely be on Snapseed. Um, and Instagram in its built-in editor has some of these functions as well. So that's sort of the basics of editing. And uh, these things are, are 
you know, you can take all these things along with the rules of composition to really enhance your photos and bring them to life um, and, you know, make them a bit more visually, visually interesting. So you've kind of got two pieces of the puzzle here. You know how to um, edit your photo. Um, you know how to expose your photo. You sort of understand the rules of composition. And now you can build on the basics of editing. Um, like I said, I'm going to leave a ton of resources for you that you can sort of go after the fact and, and learn a bit more about some of these functions uh, when it comes to composition, editing, and exposure, and all that good stuff. And this may seem a bit daunting. It may seem like, oh my God, like I don't know where to start. But remember, always have fun. Uh, when I first started photography, um, it was something fun for me. It was never anything to, you know, um, make my or do a job. And I'm very thankful that I get to do that now. Uh, because it's something that I love and do. Um, but the key is to always have fun and, and remember the, the reason you're taking that photo in the first place. It's to, you know, capture a moment, uh, to share that moment and maybe tell a story or, or whatever it may be. But um, always have fun with it and, and don't get too bogged down in the details. Um, I'm giving you all the details that you would need to know to take a good photo so you can understand and, and know the elements that go into it. Um, but don't get so fixated on it that you sort of get taken away from the moment or the thing that you're trying to capture. Um, so this is just a bit of a summary here. And the last thing I will leave you with is a bit of a, a photo assignment. So um, we've all been in, uh, you know, sort of lockdown quarantine and, and things like that for the last two months, two and a half months or so. And I want to challenge you guys uh, with the knowledge that I've given you, the, the sort of tips that I've given you to, um, you know, create a series of photos or three individual photos um, about your work from home life um, and what that means to you, whether it be your workspace or your new office setup or whatever it may be, or how your work life has changed uh, if you are working from home, or maybe you've just gone back to work and uh, you've had to abide by a lot of these physical distancing rules and uh, restrictions in place at the work uh, when you return back to work. Um, I want you to try and capture that using some of the rules of composition and some of the editing basics I've left you with. The second one is I want to capture, I want you to capture your new normal. You know, um, I feel a lot of things have changed in the last two months and um, there's a lot of things that are going to be the new normal, whether it be universal masking um, or washing your hands 50 times a day, uh, whatever it may be. Um, I want you to capture something that embodies that. And this photo here is, um, I've actually recently gotten to Call of Duty. So I play a lot of Warzone and I play a lot of online multiplayer. I used to a lot in university, but I stopped since then. Um, but I've kind of gotten back into it in my free time. Uh, it's, it's fun. It's a bit addicting, I'll be honest. Uh, and the last thing is uh, your active life. Um, you know, it's important to stay healthy during this time and try and stay mobile as best we can um, you know, with, within the physical distancing and restrictions that we do have in place still. So I want you to capture something um, of yourself uh, being active as best you can. Um, my sort of active lifestyle is um, going for bike rides. And um, I, love, I don't live downtown. I love biking from my neighborhood in the East End to downtown. It's about 30 kilometers or so. And uh, it really gets, you know, gets me out of the house and clears my mind a little bit. And um, you know, a little bit of physical activity doesn't hurt. And I want you guys to follow us and tag us on Cremble. We want you guys to... Uh, we want we want to see these photos. You know, we'd love to see them, and we we'd love to feature them, of course, with your with your permission, um, and hashtag uh, Kremble photo assignment, uh, so that you know we can keep track of it. Because we'll I'll I'll be following the hashtag hashtag on the Kremble Instagram, so we can see all the photos that are being um, part of this photo challenge. So that's really it about me. I know that was a lot of information, you know, talking about photography. Um, I, I wanted to do, to do that because I felt like I've learned so much in the last eight years of being a photographer. Um, uh, I still, reluct I still um, reluct reluctantly call myself that, but uh, I hope that this helps you. I hope that uh, you can take some of these principles and um, apply them to your photography, whether they be science related, whether they be, you know, um, healthcare related or whether they're for your uh, own use in your own personal lives and you want to just start capturing memories of, of the world around you and the people that you interact with on a daily basis. Um, so that's going to be it for me and I'm happy to take any questions. And like I said, uh, I'll have a ton of resources um, in a follow-up as well so that you guys can sort of do a little more learning and more digging and understanding of all the things that I've touched on here.
So I, I guess I'll turn it back over to Carly if there's any questions, if she can. Great, thanks so much, Twain. Very informative. Um, we have a lot to learn. I certainly <laughs> have a lot to learn with respect to photography. I think I just about only use the brightness and the contrast whenever I'm editing, so maybe I'll yeah. up my game a little bit more. I'm going to go through a couple of the comments and any questions that pop up within the chat. Sure. I just want to let everyone know that's online that uh, those who have joined us today are going to be entered into a draw for a some crumble swag. So we have some crumble mugs that we give away each session. So uh, we will get to that momentarily. Um, the first comment, uh, Karen Davis has said that she often cuts off legs to make a more appealing shot. And so the person is not so small, especially in a group shot. I'm not sure if right. you want to speak to that, Twain. Yeah, uh, so in group shots, that's, that's understandable, right? Um, if you're taking a group shot uh, and you, you kind of just want to focus on the upper half of their bodies, which is, which is good because uh, you want to fo focus in on the people that are in the group. And that's completely fine. Um, it's more so when you're, you know, maybe taking more of what I like to call as environmental portrait, where maybe it's a research student or a trainee or a lab tech or a PI, and they're kind of in their element and maybe they might be at the lab bench or they may be, you know, doing an experiment and you want to capture everything around them that's part of their world, which, you know, might be some equipment, might be some reagents. In that case, you know, maybe taking a full length portrait uh, to showcase the environment and the person in that environment may be helpful. But understandably so for group shots, it's, it's okay to cut off legs, but ensure that it's, it's not obvious that you've cut off their legs where you kind of show three fourths of the person and you know, just their shoes are cut off. Um, be deliberate about it, you know, maybe just do the, um, the, the waist and up and, and that way it's, you know, you're focused in more on, on the group as a whole and those individuals as part of that group. Great, thank you so much. There was a comment from Yan here that with the mm -hmm. black background, it was challenging to see the menu tabs that you were explaining. Okay. I okay. do know that you're sending out some resources later, yes. so perhaps it can cover some of those areas. Yeah, as well. for sure. Those the resources will definitely go into um, all the things I talked about with Lightroom there, um, and they'll go into a little more detail as well than than what I touch on. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I didn't know how it would look on Zoom, but um, I'll, I'll definitely have those resources that you guys can go back to and uh, um, understand how all those functions work in in the editor. Okay, great. Um, so there's another question here. What editor should we use on a laptop instead of on a phone? Um, if you're on a laptop, um, I, I stick to Lightroom. I know that's paid, uh, but if you have an Adobe service, um, I, I'll do some research and try and find ones that are free. I know if you're on a Mac, Preview does have an editor built in that has some of the features I talked about in Lightroom. For Windows, I'm not entirely sure what uh, programs are available, but I will try and find some resources um, that can help you with that. But for me personally, I use Lightroom because I'm subscribed to the Adobe um, service. And it's actually not bad. I think it's, it's 10 bucks a month, um, as much as a Spotify um, subscription. And you get Photoshop and Lightroom uh, for 10 bucks a month for the, for the entire year. And I think if you prepay for the year, it'll be a bit less. So those are some options, um, but for free ones, I'll, I'll definitely do some research and try and find some for you. Great, thanks so much. So we have a random but useful tip here to clean and wipe your lens. I've yes. <laughs> so many pictures, but it turns out my lens was just dirty. Yes, uh, that's a good one. Yes, especially with cell phones. We put them in our pockets, we put them on our desks. Uh, we're handling them day in and day out, you know, um, in between meals and things like that, your hands get dirty. and. So definitely clean your lens, preferably use a microfiber cloth because anything else may scratch or create micro scratches on the lens um, and you don't want that. So um, try and use a soft uh, microfiber cloth, some, similar to something you'd use if you uh, were to clean glasses or an LCD screen or anything like that. Great. Just going back to the last question there about uh, desktop versions, Michael yes. has just indicated that GIMP on Windows is yes. actually free. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Uh, we have one last question. Uh, this is from Manoj. Should I be standing mm -hmm. straight up and shooting this photograph from eye level or is there a better perspective? 
That's a great question. And, and that's not something I touched on in this presentation, but um, another one of those rules of composition is perspective. And that's absolutely up to you. Uh, perspective plays a really big role in, in how you present your subject. If you're show, shooting from say a, a low angle upwards, that sort of, and if it's a person, it sort of implies that that person is in a position of power versus something from top down where you make that person feel or look, uh, have that person look smaller in the frame. Um, it, I think if, depending on your, on your application and, and need, uh, you can play around with perspective and, and don't be afraid to move around and find a perspective that works well based on you know, the composition within your scene, the lighting within your scene and how that plays a role in, in the type of mood your final photo um, and message your final photo will sort of um, you know, elicit from your audience. So you know, play around with it, have fun with it, um, find the perspective that works for you. And you know, there's, no, there's no such thing as a wrong perspective. It just you know, happens to work or doesn't happen to work. So just play around with it and move uh, around with your camera uh, to find that perspective. Great. Well, thank you so much. We are now going to move over to Amy Ma, and I believe we will likely have Ellie joining us as a guest again, and we're going to do a quick draw for a crumble mug. Hello, everyone. Is my camera on? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, welcome to everyone. Uh, for those who are uh, it's your first time joining us, welcome to uh, Crumble's Coffee Breaks. Um, so here is our, our, our guest uh, every Friday. We have her um, draw their name. So just so you're familiar with the process, anybody who has attended, uh, we, we know and we see the participant list. And I have everybody's names uh, in a little uh, sheet of paper. And, and, and uh, we're right now going to ask Ellie to draw uh, the name of somebody. Can you please pick one? and then show, open it up, and then show the camera the name that you saw. Let's see. Oh, I see her. I see her here. Can everybody see it? It is Allison from our tech, Technology Development and Commercialization Office, Allison Ab. So Allison, you are the lucky winner of a Crumble mug. Please contact her office uh, when we're all Yay, back on site thanks. and we can arrange for that. Thanks so much. I'm so excited. This was great. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amy and Ellie, and congratulations, Allison. I'm going to thank Twain once again for a great job on today's session, and I'm going to hand it over to Heather Sherman to close today's talk. Sounds good. Thank you, Carly. Thanks, Twain. Great presentation, and now we can all shoot like a pro, and our photos will look exactly like Twain's, I'm sure, right? We can all work and aspire to that. Um, anyway, thanks everybody for coming next week. Uh, we have on the schedule Media Training 101. I'm going to tweak the title slightly to call it the science of storytelling, which is going to include um, a lot about media training, but I feel like um, there seems to be more of an appetite for understanding storytelling and how it can benefit you in the science world. So I'm going to change it in, um, in uh, the calendar and in the invite, but it is still gonna incorporate media training into it, but we'll call it the science of storytelling. The following week, we've got a wild card Q and A. We've already got a couple of questions in, but if there's anything specific that you want us to speak on or any specific questions that you have, uh, you can certainly send them to me in advance and, and we can get uh, prepped for that. But that looks to be an exciting one too. So thanks everybody. Have a great weekend and thanks for coming.